In early 2025, an AI system in a Nairobi clinic diagnosed a rare cancer, and then it changed its own diagnosis with absolutely no human input. When the engineers went back and reviewed the logs, they couldn't explain why. You see, no new data came in, nothing changed in the system. No rule was broken. It just decided. And, well, I was part of that team. And in that exact moment, staring at these logs that made zero sense, it hit me. GPT-4, it isn't the future, it's the foundation. The real power, the real revolution, it's happening right now in the next wave of specialized large language models. You know, MOE, LRM, VLM, SLM, LAM, HLM, and LCM. Each one of these is being designed not just to chat with you, but to act, to reason, to see, and ultimately to decide. So today, we are pulling back the curtain. I'm gonna show you exactly what these eight distinct types of models really do, and more importantly, how they are already beginning to reshape our world in ways that go far, far beyond your computer screen. I'm Marcel Masaga. As an AI engineer and a five-time founder, I've spent more than two decades deep in the trenches, building AI systems for the real world. I'm not talking about sterile labs. I mean out in the wild, in places where technology meets the messy, unpredictable reality of human life. We're talking about diagnostic tools used in clinics all across East Africa, all the way to globally recognized startups that I bootstrapped from the ground up. I've advised investors on where to place their bets, and I've served on global bodies wrestling with the really tough ethical questions this technology forces us all to confront. All of that work, every single project, has been driven by one relentless question. How do we build AI that doesn't just work, but that actually matters? Welcome to our explainer. We're here to cut through the hype, get to the heart of the matter, so we can all learn to build a little wiser in this new age of artificial intelligence. You know, we still talk about AI like it's this single monolithic thing, some kind of giant brain in the cloud that just answers our questions. But that model, that's just the starting point. Today, we're going on a real journey through the true landscape of AI as it exists right now. First up, we're going to break down the foundation, GPT, and really get into why its limits mean it just can't be the future. Then, you'll see how AI is learning to specialize, using new, way more efficient architectures. From there, we'll witness this monumental leap, the jump from just guessing answers to performing genuine, evidence-based reasoning. And then, we'll explore how these thinking machines are now moving from just thought into real-world action. Finally, we'll venture out to the frontier, looking at models that are chasing deeper, more conceptual meaning, and we'll wrap it all up with what this incredible power demands from all of us, a mandate for wisdom. Okay, let's dive right in. Our first stop has to be the model that kicked off this entire global conversation, because to really understand where we're all going, we first have to be ruthlessly clear about where we are right now. That means understanding the incredible role of GPT, but more importantly, its profound limitations. So let's start with the one you already know, the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, or GPT. This is the engine under the hood of ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, all the big ones. And let's be clear, it is a true marvel of engineering. It's built on an architecture that lets it process and generate text that is just stunningly human-like. But here's the crucial point that always gets lost in the marketing hype. GPT is not designed for reasoning. It's designed for pattern completion. At its very core, you can think of it as the world's most sophisticated autocomplete. It looks at a sequence of words you give it, and then it predicts the next most statistically probable word, based on the patterns it learned from the trillions, literally trillions, of words it was trained on. This makes it absolutely brilliant for tasks that rely on manipulating language, you know, writing emails, summarizing long articles, even mimicking a specific writing style. But here's the catch. When you give it a problem that isn't already well represented in its training data, it doesn't stop and say, you know what, I don't know. It does what it was built to do. It predicts. It guesses. It constructs an answer that sounds plausible. Now, in a high-stakes environment like healthcare or finance or engineering, a plausible-sounding guess isn't just wrong, it's extraordinarily dangerous. And this is precisely why, in any serious mission-critical application, GPT is no longer the final product. It's the base layer. A better way to think of it is like the operating system, not the killer app. The real innovation, the stuff that really matters, happens in the specialized applications that get built on top of it. At SIHIA, the healthcare tech company I advise, we leverage GPT-4 as a powerful assistant. It's amazing. It can take a doctor's hurried audio notes and generate a perfectly structured summary for patient's file in seconds. It can create an initial draft of a follow-up email, but it is never, and I mean ever, the final decision maker. That power is reserved. 
Why? Because when a patient's life is on the line, you need so much more than just generative fluency. You need verifiable truth, you need clear accountability, and you need explainability for every single decision. And those are three things a pure generative model, just by its very nature, simply cannot provide on its own. It's the foundation upon which true, reliable intelligence absolutely must be built. So once you realize the limits of a single monolithic model, it naturally leads to the first major evolutionary step. I mean, if one giant brain trying to know everything is both inefficient and really prone to error, what's the alternative? Well, this is where AI learns to specialize. It's a new architecture that is both more powerful and way more efficient, the mixture of experts. All right, let's talk about MOE, mixture of experts. Instead of having one gigantic model trying to be a world-class doctor, a lawyer, and a programmer all at the same time, the MOE architecture is fundamentally different. It uses this really clever gating mechanism, and you can just think of it like a smart router, to direct any incoming question to one of many smaller, highly specialized expert subnetworks. The best analogy I can think of is a hospital, right? When you walk into an emergency room, you don't send every single patient, no matter what their issue is, to the single most famous brain surgeon on staff. That would be a catastrophic waste of time and resources. Instead, a triage nurse assesses the situation and routes the patient to the right specialist. Cardiology for a heart issue, neurology for a head injury, you get the picture. MOE does exactly this for data. You'll have one expert network that's been trained only on medical journals, another only on legal case law, a third only on Python code. And this gives us two massive advantages. First, efficiency. For any given query, only the relevant experts are activated, which saves an enormous amount of computational power, energy, and of course money. Second, and this is way more important, is depth. Each expert network can be fine-tuned to have an incredibly deep understanding of its specific domain, instead of just a shallow knowledge of everything. But this elegant solution introduces a really critical point of failure. That gating mechanism, our triage nurse, can become a black box. If that router misinterprets a complex query, say it sends a nuanced question about medical consent to an expert that was only trained on business contracts, the output won't just be wrong, it will be dangerously flawed. And because the system is designed to be sparse, which means only parts of it are active at any given time, auditing the full decision-making chain to figure out why that error happened becomes incredibly difficult. It raises this core challenge of system design. Who is accountable for the flawed output? Is it the router? Is it the expert it chose? Or is it the engineers who built the system in the first place? This is a problem we're actively working to solve right now. Because even with this challenge, Moe represents a huge leap towards building more scalable and ultimately more reliable AI. Okay, so now we move from making systems more efficient to a truly profound shift in their capability. This next step is about fundamentally changing what these models can do we're talking about a transition from systems that just complete patterns to systems that can perform genuine acts of reasoning and perception. This is the domain of large reasoning models and vision language models. Okay, this distinction is so crucial to understand. A traditional LLM like GPT gets a question and it just starts generating an answer. When it hits a gap in its own internal knowledge, it does what it's designed to do. It smoothly fills that gap with a statistically plausible guess. This is what we call a hallucination. An LRM, or large reasoning model, operates on a completely different principle. It doesn't guess, it researches. When an LRM is faced with a knowledge gap, its programming literally compels it to stop, recognize its own ignorance, and then actively go out and retrieve information from a set of trusted, verified sources to construct an evidence-backed answer. This is the fundamental difference between, say, a confident fool who pretends to know everything, and a wise scholar who knows how to find things out. And this workflow brilliantly shows how it works. An LRM uses a process we call an agentic RAG workflow. That stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So let's walk through it together. First, it receives your query. But instead of immediately trying to answer, it generates a set of internal search instructions, basically a research plan. Next, it executes that plan, retrieving documents from a trusted database, like a curated library of scientific papers or maybe a company's proprietary data. Then, it synthesizes all that retrieved information, cross-references it, and evaluates its own answer. And if it's not confident enough, it iterates. It refines its search and its synthesis over and over until it reaches a high confidence threshold. Only then does it deliver the final evidence-backed answer, often with citations so you can check its work. This is AI that knows what it doesn't know. In Kenya, we deployed an LRM to act as an agricultural advisor. A farmer asks, why are my maize crops turning yellow? A simple GPT might hallucinate an answer about common pests. 
The LRM, however, retrieves real-time local soil composition data, recent satellite rainfall patterns, regional pest outbreak reports, and current fertilizer prices from a co-op database. It then synthesizes all of this into a specific, actionable answer. Your soil pH is acidic because of the recent heavy rains. You should apply two bags of agricultural lime. Also, a new blight has been reported in your region. Here are the symptoms you need to look for. Now that is the difference between a simple chatbot and a true cognitive partner. Now, parallel to this huge leap in reasoning is an equally profound leap in perception. This brings us to the VLM, the Vision Language Model. This is where AI basically opens its eyes. A VLM isn't just one single model, but a sophisticated fusion of two. It combines a vision encoder, which is an AI trained to understand the content of pixels in an image, with a language model, like the ones we've been talking about. The process is pretty straightforward. The AI is trained on millions of images that are paired with text descriptions. It learns to connect what it sees in the image with the words used to describe it. The end result is an AI that can look at a photograph of, say, a busy market scene and not just identify the objects, but actually describe the interactions, infer the mood, and answer nuanced questions about what's happening. But this incredible power comes with a really critical engineering challenge, context, and data bias. See, any model is only as good as the data it's trained on. If a VLM is trained predominantly on images from Western countries, it might completely fail to correctly identify traditional African clothing or tools or important cultural artifacts. And in a clinical setting, this isn't just some academic problem. The stakes are life and death. A VLM that's designed to detect skin cancer could fail to identify a malignant melanoma on dark skin if its training data almost exclusively featured images of light skin. That's a catastrophic system failure. And this is exactly why deployment requires such meticulous engineering. We have to purposefully curate our datasets, ensuring they are diverse and truly representative of the populations they're going to serve. And for any critical task, we absolutely must implement human-in-the-loop validation. An AI can be a powerful tool for augmenting a doctor's perception, but it can never replace their judgment. So, now we have models that can reason with evidence and perceive the visual world. That's incredible. But how do we take that intelligence out of these massive, power-hungry data centers and actually put it into the hands of people in the real world? And how do we empower it to not just think, but to do? Well, this is the domain of small language models and large action models. Now, I want you to meet the unsung hero of the AI world, the small language model, or SLM. While all the headlines are chasing bigger and bigger models with trillions of parameters, SLMs are quietly proving that for many real-world tasks, smaller is actually smarter. I like to think of them as frugal geniuses. They have far fewer parameters and a lean architecture that's designed for one thing, efficiency. This allows them to run faster, cheaper, and, this is the most important part, directly on devices with limited resources. We're talking about your smartphone, a tablet in a classroom, or a simple computer in a rural clinic, often without even needing a constant internet connection. This isn't just a nice-to-have feature, it's a total game-changer for accessibility. In clinics across East Africa, we're using SLMs to power diagnostic tools right on a health worker's phone. Look, they can't write you a sonnet, but they can provide instant, life-saving answers to questions like, what are the key differential symptoms between malaria and typhoid? Or, what's the correct antibiotic dosage for a child who weighs 20 kilograms? It's just a powerful reminder that useful intelligence doesn't have to be massive to be meaningful. And now we meet the true game changer, the large action model, or LAM. If a GPT generates text, a LAM generates actions. This is the brain behind the AI agents that can interact directly with the digital world on your behalf. They don't just talk about booking a flight. They can actually go to the airline's website, select your seat, and complete the purchase. They can manage your calendar, send your emails, or even execute financial trades for you. The architecture here is way more complex than a simple text generator. It operates in a constant loop. It observes its digital environment, like a new email arriving or a stock price changing. It processes that information, it formulates a plan, and then it sends a concrete command to a tool, like an email client or a trading API. This is genuine autonomous agency. It's not just thinking anymore, it's doing. Of course, this capability immediately raises the specter of unintended consequences. When an AI can act on your behalf without direct moment-to-moment -moment oversight, accountability becomes a massive and, frankly, unresolved engineering problem. So who's responsible when a lamb misunderstands an instruction and books a non-refundable flight to the wrong city, or sends a sensitive document to the wrong person, or executes a disastrous financial trade because it misinterpreted a news headline? As a fractional CTO advising companies that are building these exact kinds of agents, my guidance is unwavering. For any high-stakes action, you must engineer a human approval loop, a final confirm button. 
The goal isn't to build unchecked automation. The goal is to build powerful, augmented intelligence, a partnership where humans guide, validate, and ultimately remain in command of the systems we create. We're now entering the most advanced and in a lot of ways, the most philosophical frontier of these models. We're moving beyond just performing tasks to grappling with abstract ideas, complex relationships, and the very nature of meaning itself. This is the realm of hierarchical and large concept models. Let's take a look at this duality. First, you have the hierarchical large language model, or HLM. This model doesn't just process information, it explicitly models the relationships between different concepts. For instance, it might use one LM to understand a user's stated goals, another to analyze their actual behavior, and a third to model the hierarchical relationship between them to predict the next tool or piece of information they'll need. This is the engine of true hyperpersonalization. But the risk here is creating a system that becomes so good at predicting our needs that it actually begins to shape our desires, potentially creating manipulative, addictive loops. Then, on the other side of this frontier, you have the Large Concept Model, or LCM. While other models map words to other words, an LCM tries to map words to abstract concepts. Think of it this way. A GPT knows the word bravery often appears near words like soldier or fighter fighter. An LCM tries to build an internal model of what bravery actually is, a concept involving fear, risk, and action in the face of that fear, so it can apply that concept to a new situation it has never seen before, like a student speaking up against a bully. This is a critical step toward building AI that can align with human values, but it opens up a really profound question. Can a machine truly understand a concept like justice or compassion, or is it just creating an incredibly complex statistical simulation of how we talk about those things? This brings us to our final and I think most important section. After this tour of these eight powerful and rapidly evolving tools, we really need to take a step back. We need a reality check on what this all means for our work, for our societies, and for ourselves. This isn't just about technology anymore. It's about our future. This is the mandate for wisdom. Now, here's what they didn't tell you in the product announcements. These eight model types we've talked about, they aren't science fiction. They are being built and deployed right now in our clinics, in our courtrooms, and in our capital markets. And the public conversation that we're all having is completely focused on the wrong thing. For decades, the biggest fear has been about AI taking our jobs. But the much bigger, the more subtle threat is humans losing our purpose our sense of agency, our drive to solve hard problems, our feeling of belonging in a world that is increasingly managed by autonomous systems we don't even understand. My work on the ground has shown me that the old narrative of technological progress and who gets to lead it might just be wrong. With its incredibly young population, its mobile-first infrastructure, and its deep wells of communal wisdom, the African continent could actually lead the world in deploying ethical, human-centric AI, building systems that are designed to serve communities, not just shareholders. Because when AI starts making decisions we can't audit, when it acts in ways we can't explain, the solution isn't just more code. We need more wisdom. We need sound ethical frameworks. We need more courage from our leaders and from our builders. We need to empower leaders, engineers, and citizens everywhere to ask the hardest question of all. It is the single question that will define the next century of our history. It is not, can we build this? With the tools we've discussed today, the answer to that is almost always going to be yes. The real question, the only one that truly matters is, should we? If you found this valuable, do three quick things for me. One, hit like right below. It tells the YouTube algorithm that this content matters. Two, subscribe and hit that little bell. Because next week, I'm breaking down the one crucial phase that 99% of AI startups skip and how you can use it to ship your products faster. And three, watch my latest analysis, work and purpose, from productivity to meaning making. It's already changing how engineers and founders are thinking about AI. I'm Marcel Masaga. Until next time, think deeper, build wiser, and lead with courage.